I mean, if you have any just fundamental gratitude for any type of leverage that we get by existing today that nobody else had in the past, or just like the resources that are available, that it's like middle school used to have to go to, well, I used to have to go to the library and spend two hours to look through resources for a paper that I had to write. Now I won't go to page two on Google, you know? And it's like, yeah, it, there are so many resources and such an advanced potential to do things. But it, we have this idea about um, habits, like you hit the nail on the head that it's like, well, there's this point in the future where I'll be primed to do X, Y, or Z. There's this point in the future where I'll be ready, where I'll be good enough, where I'll be whatever. And it starts, like it starts with living that life. You know, it's like year 255. If you want to get 300 pounds, you have to eat like somebody who's 300 pounds. You know, yeah. it doesn't happen otherwise. And it's, uh, it's really unfortunate because, and I don't know if that comes down to uh, general self-sabotage or if people just don't get educated enough at an early age. I was talking to my wife earlier, like I'm a chronic uh, uh, self-help reader. <laughs> like I just have a have bunch you read of atomic habits. I have it on my desk right now. Uh, I adore that. <laughs> atomic habits is good. I is a little bloated. The premise is very powerful. Once it gets into, and you notice this from self-help books, they're all, um, uh, it, it's like, you have the premise, they break it off into chapters. And then it's like, uh, anecdotal story response, anecdotal story response. And once I get so many chapters in, I just start flipping through a uh, very powerful premise. And I think it, it's exactly yeah. right. It's like, you, it's like you aim to make these steady improvements over time and they compound and it's absolutely true. It's, it's time invested, just like it would be money invested if you're putting into a savings account. And I'm an idiot in a lot of response, a lot of respects. But when I was young, I got infatuated with training. I just did it because it gave me these other benefits. And as a byproduct of that, I accrued a lot of time that added into something substantive. And it's like without that commitment, without the thread of investing every single day, every week, you know, you don't get that. What are the other ones I have? I have, um, uh, I got the subtle art of not giving a fuck, which is way better than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to yeah, be some I, edgy, like I, that, I had to get recommended it four times before I bought. Cause I was like, come on, fuck that. No, this is, uh, I'm not, I'm not, really it looks dumb, <laughs> right? Like the title you're like, okay. Like, you know, a 16 year old wrote it and they thought it would sell because it had yeah. the, the F bomb on it. And I read it and I was like, this is actually much more profound than I expected it to be. And it was well-written. It was entertaining. Um, and I read like the thing that got, the reason I'm here now, I read the four hour work week like 10 years ago. And uh, that started me on this path. And I've read, uh, I just reread the seven habits of highly effective people. And I'm, I kind of, I just started attacking, going through with the highlighter and trying to, you know, consolidate the good points because philosophy is really fun. But when you go back to philosophy that you learn in school, they don't like to, uh, uh, pinpoint hard conclusions doesn't really get relevant to the uh, doesn't get related to what's going on in your life right now. So it's nice to have like, okay, I, I view this as like modern philosophy. It's like this, these yeah. are just the rules by which you live your life that we think might get a better result. And you can experiment, you can put it into practice, whether it's your mindset, whether it's the things you do on a day to day. Um, what, what's the first big one you read? What's the thing that got you uh, got you reading those types of books? It was actually Atomic Habits. It was really okay. Yeah, that's. I think that's the reason. That's the one first one I tell people is because I read it when I was I was pretty young, uh -huh. and like I was like, "Whoa, this is this is big brain stuff." Wow, <laughs> you know, like because well, I was like, I've got all these things that I'm supposed to do. You know, like I've always I, I've never felt like I have any discipline when it comes to training. I just really like training, and because I like training so much, I'm gonna you know eat this food. I'm gonna do all this other hard stuff because I like it a lot. You know, I, I don't feel like I work hard in any capacity. Uh, if anything, I'm probably pretty lazy because I do a really bad job of all the stuff I don't like. You know, I'm a terrible businessman. I like, I shouldn't be poor. I have plenty of demand as a coach. I could put out resources, but I'm like, this is boring. I, I don't like this. And, you know, I'm like, I, I, when I first read that book, it was like a novel to me that I was like, oh, I mean, I don't have to like something to do it if I build it into my day. And like, you know, like the whole habit pairing thing. I was like, oh, this is how people do things they don't like. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that stuff, when, when it fits that like gap in your understanding, 
it's it's like an atomic bomb going off. It's just this huge eye-opening event. You're like, oh my God. And I hate how much uh, shit that the field gets because it does, it gets, there's this whole industry dedicated towards like vilifying self-help books as being predatory or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, when you have your shit together, you look at this stuff, you're like, well, everybody knows that. It's like, yeah, very, very few people actually know that. And well, it's like, fit, it's like fitness YouTube is even if they know it, they're not doing it right. There's a lot exactly. of things in there. That I could have been like, that's not, I could, I could have told you it that bears repeating. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Bears repeating because it's not just the first time you pick it up, you start doing it. You have to be reminded, especially we take for granted the shit we do and do well because our parents were barking it into our ears at a very early age and just assimilated, you know, between that and our predisposition to being in your case, being kind of neurotic, it sounds like to be very structured. Yeah. In my case, kind of the opposite. I'm a little too lackadaisical in a lot of areas, but that's why I was attracted to that because it's like, okay, these are lessons that I didn't quite get at the right time. But when you're a late bloomer, you got to hustle to make up. And that means not, not just going over the homework, revisiting it, sharpening the saw, as they say. The first thing, I'm almost embarrassed to admit this. I was like, I was your age, I think. And I did not have my shit together remotely to the degree that you did, not with lifting and not in life. And there was this sense like, like I need a spark, like the potential's there. And everybody loves to jerk themselves off over their own potential. But potential yeah. doesn't mean anything. It doesn't put food on the table. You have to actualize it. And uh, it was, God, it was a Tony Robbins box set. I ordered off of a late night infomercial, like somebody going through a midlife crisis. It was like the box set of, of CDs. Cause I, my job, I was dry. There was a delivery driver at the time. And I just listened to it. Um, and I remember I got a testimony. I lived in Redlands, California at the time, which is where the guy that made tap out is from. So he used to go to like the gym we were at. And I just remember he was one of the testimonials. That's when tap out was huge. It was like, yeah, just becoming very, very popular in, uh, in mixed martial arts. And I just remember he gave in the guy's tattoos going up his neck, but he was talking about being an entrepreneur and being self-made. And then it was Tony Robbins giving his shtick. And I'm like, I'm sold. And it was so hacky. I had to hide it. Like I couldn't let my friends see it. It was like in the back seat with like my sweater over it. But that was probably one of the most life-changing experiences I had just because I kind of opened up, took it seriously, like I have some shit to learn. And there were just, it, was, it wasn't everything, but the gaps that it filled were like, I don't know how people get along if they don't uh, solve these problems, if they don't mm -hmm. figure out what's missing to that degree. So, so that, I mean, that fits and it tells me so much about you because I was going to comment earlier, like one of the most impressive things about you is the fact that you started with this structure, like you started with this 10 week type block periodization program. Nobody starts with that. that. That's like saying I started writing in cursive, like, like nobody starts with that, but that's such an obvious, uh, um, that, that lends itself obviously to the success you had is by starting with that. But, um, good. I'm interested or I'm eager to hear the fact that I'm not the only, uh, the only person out here reading through self-help books, in my free time. Yeah, no, I mean, and like you said, it's like those, just, just like how PRs are like a wonderful feeling and the longer you lift, the more, the few and far between they are and they mean that much more, you know, I, like, I love your podcast. You talk about how like, yeah, no, it's not often that I have like the training light bulb moment anymore, but when I do, it's awesome. It's like, that makes my day. I'm like, yeah. holy shit. I have never thought of that. I have spent the last 10 years spending most of my time thinking about lifting weights. It's just, I don't have other hobbies, you know, which I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, I've, I'm happy. I really like my life. And I just like thinking about lifting weights and, you know, consuming information about lifting weights. And I've been doing that for so long that when I'm like presented with like a novel concept, wow, that made my day. Like if everything brightens up around me, I'm like, this is awesome. And when you talk about it on your podcast, I'm like, that's super relatable. You know, just us people who just like thinking about lifting weights, you know, those just like lip PRs, it becomes more few and far between, but it's awesome when it happens. Yeah. And they're necessary to keep, keep things shifting forward. Right. It's, you can't mm -hmm. assume that you've got it all figured out. In fact, your basic assumption should be, even when you feel like you have it figured out that you don't have it figured out because that'll make you that was another one of the big, uh, not a revelation. That was something I knew, but to see it written explicitly in one of the books that talked about how often people are wrong and are, and you see it mirrored in all of these different books because it kind of fits modern human psychology. We like to believe that we're correct. We like to start with the assumption that everything we did to get a little bit of success is all we'll ever have to do. I read, Jesus, I read uh, who moved my cheese, which is like, it's, it's suited for kids. It's a whole allegory of like, you have these two mice and you have these two like people and they live in a maze 
And the mice, like every time the cheese gets moved, they pick up their running shoes and go get the cheese where the people are like entitled. And they're like, well, it's like something it's beautiful for reading your uh, reading to your kids. But it's like, you know, oh, it'll come back or I shouldn't have to go run and chase cheese. And it's such a dumb analogy. But it's like, anyways, that um, had that thread underneath it of of how often people are wrong and our assumptions are wrong. And if we start with that, it's so much more easy to change in the face of some crisis or things aren't going our own way, or if your bench press isn't going up, or if, you know, you keep getting injured, it's like, there's some assumption that isn't clicking. So, you know, you need to go after it. And anyways, as, as I've been doing this more and more, it's so easy at this point to just think, you know, what you know, and mm. if, if that's fine. If you like, just want to be in this like middle rung of, you know, you're okay for the people that know you, but you're never going to outgrow that. And, and if you have very serious competitive goals, if you want to stand out, it's, so it's atomic habits, baby. You got to keep growing, growing the entire way. You can't slow down. And it's really a double-edged sword though, right? Because if, if I hate the word, like, let's say we keep ourselves humble enough to know that we don't know much, right? Like we always can learn quite a bit more. There's people better than you, right? I mean, maybe even consuming lower level information, maybe you hear something phrased in such a way that it kind of pivots how you think about something or how you explain it to your clients. Like I'll still watch a video that's aimed at lifters a lot below me or no less than me. And I think a lot of people are off put by it. They're like, oh, screw this video. I already know all of this. I might hear a phrasing and I'm like, wow, that's so much better of a way to say that. Or that's just not even how I personally think about it. That's awesome. So it's like staying below that level of ego is, is really productive, right? But if you go too low and you don't have enough self-confidence, good luck achieving competitive success. There's just an innate level of confidence needed approaching weights or approaching competitions to not just fall apart mentally, right? And it's always like trying to stay in that zone or like whether it's like you as a coach, right? You need to be confident enough that you're not constantly changing your guys' training or pivoting everything you think, right? But like, you know, humble enough that you're not going to be stagnant and you know, still going to improve. And it's like, that it's a tough, it's a tough battle to, to play. No, yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and we're never done learning, you know, we're never done. One of the things that I appreciate about someone like uh, Mike Isretel, who's a staple and you kind of take for granted, he's been there for a long time and he'll probably be there for a long time. But just in going over some of his stuff, he has a habit and it seems like just a default way of explaining things where it's always like, here's the rule. Now, here's what happens if you do too much of the rule. And then here's what happens when you don't do enough. And then it, he ends up boxing it in based on like the perimeter. And that's always and more and more, I've tried kind of adopting that because it's useful for yourself when you are trying to say, like, hey, where's the line of, you know, humility versus arrogance and the things that I know given X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's very easy to get off the rails when uh, you don't do that. And it also makes explaining things to other people a lot easier. 